Oh, who turns it on? Oh, good. Come in hot there. That's early. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Board of Education meeting being held in the town hall chambers. The date is Tuesday, February 25th, 2020. I appreciate if everyone turns off their cell phones and other electronic devices as this is being recorded. I will now take roll call. Mr. Cassio. Here. Miss Evans. Here. Miss Granado. Here. Mr. Lesser. Here. Mr. Michaels. Here. Miss Steinmiller Paradise. Here. Vice Chairperson Healy. Here. And Chairperson Carey is present. For the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, you weren't here. Sorry. And Mr. Riley. Present. Present. Thank you. Uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to call three Emerson Williams students up to lead us Maya Sador, James Sador, and Leah Pocklington. Please come up. Thank you guys, great job. Can we get a picture with the superintendent and chair? No? <laughs> Student and staff recognition, Mr. Emmett. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairperson Carey. Good evening, everyone. If I could please have our uh, teacher leaders and our principal from Emerson Williams come to the podium for presentation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Neela Takor, and I am the principal of Emerson Williams Elementary School. And for tonight's staff recognition, um, I would like to give a huge shout out of thanks and appreciation to my Emerson Williams leadership team. Um, I have some members of my leadership team who are standing to my right. I have Jen Cardis, who is a fifth grade teacher. Emily Woods is a fifth grade teacher and Elissa Root is a second grade teacher. And in addition to these women who are standing up here with me tonight, I have three other members of our leadership team who are seated there in the second row. Rhea Emanuel, she is a sixth grade teacher. Alex Lucas is a fifth grade teacher and Nicole Utrusis is a, is a kindergarten teacher. Um, I know that a couple of weeks ago when we had all of the schools here giving our school improvement plan presentation, all throughout the presentation, we talked a lot about the leader-leader model, and it was sort of incorporated into our SIP plans. Um, but tonight, we want to talk to you about what the leader-leader model is looking like at Emerson Williams. Um, we have embraced it wholeheartedly at our school, and we are absolutely still a work in progress. Um, but we want to talk to you a little bit about our leadership team at Emerson Williams and how we are incorporating um, the leader-leader model. Hi, everybody. Um, so we are going to start just by giving you a brief overview of what leader-leader is. Um, it is a model of school leadership that prioritizes the shared responsibilities and involves all stakeholders in the school system in decision make in the decision making processes. Um, there is no real endpoint. One of the big things that was a little bit of a hurdle for us to get over in the beginning was the buy-in piece from our colleagues, um, just to get everybody to understand that it's it's a philosophy of the way that we do things. It's not a new initiative. 
Um, all aspects of our school leadership and decision making should involve staff members. So the, ki the people who are the closest to our kids should be the ones who are making the majority of the decisions about what is best for them. And that is definitely one of the qualities that we find the most important in this leader leader model. We also believe that um, our teachers should have the, should be, um, sorry, educational leaders should be at every level of the organization. So we should have leadership represented, representation at all levels of decision making within our district, which there we have lots of teacher leaders on lots of different committees from district level committees to state level committees to school level committees. So that is just a general overview of what our leader leader model is. So at Emerson Williams, we're in our second year of implementation. We started our work last year with Lyle Kurtman. He's a leadership coach um, who's worked with hundreds of schools over the last two districts. And we were fortunate enough to have training for 11 teachers in our building. And when the small group worked with Lyle, um, he had us do some inventories of ourselves to see what kinds of leaders we were and where we had room to grow. Um, and he also talked to us about seven principles of effective leadership and where we see high-performing leaders. So we looked at those seven principles and we came up with a plan for Emerson Williams. Where could we make the most growth with our leadership activity? Um, we decided to come up with a commonly owned plan, something that we all worked to create together. We worked on uh, improving our relationships with one another across the whole school. Um, and we made a commitment to always be continued to improving our achievement and continual growth. So after our initial work with Lyle, uh, Neela gave us the opportunity to expand the leadership to our entire staff. So besides the 11 of us that were initially trained, we opened it to anyone in the building who wanted to be part of leadership. And I think right now we have 19. So we currently have 19 teachers in our building who every Monday morning from 725 to 810 before the school starts, uh, we start at 810, um, from 725 to 810 every Monday morning, uh, the 19 of us meet. We have a commonly created agenda that's created by the entire staff, uh, not just the leaders, to talk about where we need growth, where we see problems that we'd like to work on. Um, and we've got representation from every grade level and every department in our school. So it's really changed the way that we're looking at areas where we'd like to grow. Um, we have experienced growing pains. Um, we're human beings and we're all creatures of habit. So uh, we've been encouraging each other to step outside of that comfort zone because we know that that's really where we're going to grow. Um, and we feel that more staff has been seeing the changes that we've made and are starting to see that it's not just another fancy program or initiative, but something that we all can take stock in to make change and feel like we're really part of the school leadership. Um, we also were fortunate enough last year to <coughs> invite uh, staff members from Stillman to come to one of our staff meetings. Uh, Mr. Emmett attended, Mrs. Destoli, and some other uh, staff members from Stillman just to be part of the conversation and hear some of the challenges we faced, some of the growth that we've made, questions that we've had about our, our future and our progress. So we've really uh, been able to see change due to our involvement with the leader leader model. So moving into year two of the leader leader model, um, we extended an invitation to all uh, certified staff members to join the team on Monday mornings uh, when we thought it was best to meet from 725 to 810. Uh, we have a very good, actually, we have an excellent uh, representation of staff. All areas are represented at these meetings. We focus hard on ensuring that all voices are heard and represented. Um, in the beginning, we, we established a format for these meetings in that um, minutes would be taken that we would spend a certain time on each of the topics that were being uh, spoken about at the agendas. Um, eventually, over time, uh, hearing from other faculty members who were not in attendance, um, they felt uh, somewhat left out. And so in reflecting upon everything we were doing, we uh, decided to make those minutes uh, shared with the rest of the staff. And, uh, and also to always welcome them to come at any time to these meetings as well. Also, if one of us can't go, uh, usually a team member uh, you know, can step in for us, which is really nice. 
um, the whole point of this is that we are constantly reflecting and changing how we do these, these meetings, which is really nice. Um, our main uh, goals that we are working on, our two main lenses are student achievement and staff morale. Um, a lot of times at our meetings, we're discussing agendas and content for future uh, collaborative meetings that we will have and what times would be good for these collaborative meetings. Um, we talk about areas that might need improvement. Sometimes all of these things can't be addressed all in one morning, of course. So we make notes to make sure that we go back to our team, talk to them about it, share those ideas when we come back. Um, if it's something that requires more diving into, uh, we've kind of branched out with some other meetings. We have a group of individuals who are currently uh, looking at how we can improve our dismissal at the end of the day and how we can possibly use a uh, different dismissal time that would then free up a lot of faculty so that they can have more collaboration time with each other. So that's one example of that. Um, so these subcommittees kind of uh, have developed. Um, what's, what's really uh, important, like we said in the beginning, it was a bit bumpy, but the fact that the majority of the staff is really on board with this philosophy is very, very promising and that we have such a, a high commitment to these meetings, which is just, it's touching to go there on a Monday morning when most people are like, oh, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to start the day to see so many smiling faces voluntarily being there at 725 because we care about each other and we care about our kids. So one of the most important tasks that we had at the beginning of this year was for us to create norms that everybody in our staff, our parent community, would be following. So we had the opportunity over the summer to start this work with John Pierce, who also works closely with Lyle Kirtman. Um, <clears throat> there was a group of um, teachers over the summer who got together and started the process. We did some brainstorming. Um, John had the uh, John talked to us about the importance of norms and kind of let us know a little bit about what it was going to be like to go through the process of creating them. So once school started, we spent one of our very first um, full staff meetings just brainstorming, coming up with some possible <coughs> norms that we felt would be important for us as we moved forward throughout this year and then moving forward. Once we had a list of ideas from our staff members, the leadership team broke this down and we categorized everything that everybody had said and broke it down into the big topics that kept coming up. During another full staff meeting, we actually had John Pierce come back and he helped us with the vetting process for developing our staff norms because, I mean, this wasn't something that we had done before, so it was nice to kind of have a guide through the whole process. So he talked to us about how we would be able to um, introduce the norms, get everybody to buy in. And of course, it's not something that happened overnight. Not everybody was you know, using them right away, but as we became more familiar with them and as we really started to focus on our norms and making sure that we had them in the back of our minds during any professional communication, um, I feel like for the most part, our staff has gotten very good at actually using them. Once we finalized our norms, um, we also shared it with our parent community. So our PTO was given a copy of it. We also um, put it out on the table during parent-teacher conferences and during any parent meetings so that everybody in our school community, parents included, had the opportunity to know what our norms were and to help us follow them. Um, this is just a list of our norms. Maybe, there we go. So these are the norms that we came up with as a group. Our entire school community, every single person in our building, every adult in our building, has agreed to adopt the set of professional learning community norms. We are all accountable for these norms. We commit to modeling these norms for everyone in our school community, including students and parents. So show mutual respect, work collaboratively with peers, exercise professional accountability, communicate openly, honestly, and directly, and demonstrate empathy in a positive manner. And I think one of the most challenging things with the norms was actually 
making sure that each, that each person was following it. So if I was having a conversation with somebody that I might have noticed wasn't following a norm, it would be part of my professional responsibility just to remind them of that. So that's still something that's a work in progress, but it's definitely something that people are more aware of now. So uh, we have six of the members of our Emerson Williams leadership team here this evening. And this slide just shows you that we have 19 members all together. We have 35 certified staff members at Emerson Williams and all together with our non-certified staff members. Um, uh, if you add them all together, we have 70 staff members. I am so incredibly thrilled that I have 19 staff members who are willing to um, actually just donate their time whether it's in the summer or whether it's during our Monday morning before school meetings to come together and collaborate on ideas and ways that we can improve our school. There is nothing at all that is smooth and clean and neat about the leader leader model. It's kind of messy because when you have 19 people sitting around a table who all have very strong opinions and who all just want to see our students succeed and our school succeed, we're not always going to agree um, but go back to the last slide where Jen was just talking about our professional norms. As we work towards really mastering those professional norms, the conversations are becoming a little bit easier and we're recognizing that sometimes we have to compromise and we have to come to consensus and that's not going to mean that we have all 70 staff members in complete agreement with everything that we do. But what is much better for our school this year is that we have so many staff members who are having their voices be heard. Um, but I wanted to give a shout out to all of the members who weren't able to make it to the Board of Education meeting tonight, but who are displayed up on the screen. Um, these, are, uh, these are some of the people who are really helping to shape how Leader Leader is working for us at Emerson Williams. And finally, we just wanted to open it up to questions. We might not have the answers, because this is all new to us as well. Um, but at Emerson Williams, what we definitely mm. have is a commitment to the Leader Leader model. And we are always in agreement that we are not going to please all of our colleagues. We're not going to have everybody leave at the end of the day happy always, because not everybody can get their way when you have 70 staff members. But what this group of people is definitely committed to is this model. And keeping this model at the forefront when we make all of our decisions at Emerson Williams towards student achievement. Um, so our leadership team is happy to answer any questions you may have about how this is going for us at Emerson Williams. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any board members with questions or comments? Ms. Granato. Well, I have a comment. I am such a proponent of the leader leader model and Lyle and John and their um, professional development with you. Um, one of the things we discussed as the board was putting this into effect to the administration and to the staff was that we allow it to mature. In other words, you know, all of a sudden in tr another year, we don't have a new philosophy that we're gonna work on. So if I, ca I can't guarantee anything, but the, the board has been behind this and to allow it to grow and mature because it really is the way to work together. We agree. Thank you, anyone else? Miss Evans? Um, hi, uh, this is fantastic. I love so many things that I heard today and I think it takes a lot of work to put this all together and now you're in year two and I'm like this last year sounded like a lot um, and it really sounds like you're seeing um, you call it buy-in I'd like to get your opinion on um, morale I know once you get introduced initiative after initiative morale can be like oh god if this is one more thing we have to do um, but now that it's growing and the communication lines are opening up and people kind of feel like they have a voice, are you seeing um, morale increase? Are you seeing more participation? And um, you know, is that just going to keep increasing? Yeah, I think, I think like you acknowledged when you first started speaking, whenever he teachers hear some new phrase or buzzword, there's always that pressure, oh, something else, how am I going to put this in? And a lot of staff initially met it with that. They didn't really know what it was. We hadn't really talked much about different philosophies of operation within the building. We hadn't really talked about the potential for leadership amongst our staff. We have so many talented educators that mm -hmm. we're fortunate enough to work with. And I think the leader leader model has really opened it up to see some of the things that my colleagues are so talented in. You know, I work on the upper elementary side of the building. I don't always get to see what the K teachers are doing in grade one. 
But when we sit Monday mornings and meet together and problem solve to hear all the different approaches and all the different skills and talents we've got, people really started realizing what we've got there and how we can work with it. And I think some of the buy-in has also come from people seeing, okay, it's not just another program. It's not just something I'm gonna check off for my day and I'm done. Um, we've actually seen some very specific actions. Um, a lot of staff members talked about the inefficiency of our bus dismissal. So they said, can we create a committee to revise that? And Neela said, go for it. That's what this is about. You know, Survey the staff, see where they think we can get better with it and go ahead with that. Um, we raised the concern to Neela about the placement of new students mid-year in our class and how classroom teachers weren't always involved in that decision. Um, sometimes the numbers on paper don't indicate the needs in a classroom. So to be able to sit as a team and say, you know, I do have 24 kids and Jen has 22, but the needs are not based on numbers. So just to be able to be part of that process. Um, we have uh, come up with some of our staff meeting agendas, not all of them, but about half of our staff meeting agendas, the staff has been open to submit ideas for topics that we'd like to do. So I think that the, uh, my colleagues are seeing that it's not an initiative, it's a philosophy that when we all are working together, that's really where we're seeing the, the change happening. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, and those are it's been great. Great examples of just taking the leadership because you guys um, aligned with our kids. Yeah. And you know the best. Well, thank you. Thank things. you for the opportunity for it. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassio. Yeah, I would just like to um, echo both what uh, Bobby and Kelly have said, but more importantly, I'm proud of you. I really am proud of what you've accomplished. It doesn't take, uh, it's not easy. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of you to stand up and be a part of your community within the school. And it's not like you're trying to shove something down there to say like, uh, let's do this. I think it opens up the door for someone that needs to be talked to or give them the ability to find a different way to go. So in saying that, I'm, I'm glad that you're embracing it. I hope the other schools are into it as much as you are at Emerson Williams. So this is a great learning tool, I think, for the entire community. And I like the fact that you're including the parents and the students as well. And I just have, how do you communicate that to the parents and to the students, your model that you're, you've got at Emerson? Is it, how do you show that? Well, one thing that helps is that one of the members of our leadership team, Elissa Root, is um, a, a, a constant member of our PTO. She serves as the liaison between our faculty and the PTO. So she attends every single meeting. So she is able to interject the types of things that we're working on as a school um, from the teacher's lens to the parents. Um, and I have needed to do frequent communication. We use the school messenger email blast a lot to make sure that parents are in the loop about our professional learning community norms and what we expect from all of our colleagues, but also what we expect from the parents when they are interacting with teachers. Um, we always wanna hear from parents. We have parents in the audience tonight with their children. We always wanna hear from parents about what's working well at Emerson Williams, what's not working well, but we're holding parents to those professional norms as well. And when parents are not following the professional norms, we talk to them about that because we need everybody on board with this. Good. And, and what Emily had said about uh, being a part of the team as far as when you're placing a student. Numbers don't mean everything. And I think it's the measurement within the classroom for the acceptance as well. So I think that speaks volumes, Emily. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I also wanna say outstanding job and you are really representing Weathersfield in a beautiful way. The way you're implementing the model the way all the teachers are buying, I think it's great. I did, and John sold me sold a little of my thunder, but I did want to talk about those two stakeholders, the students and parents, and not only in terms of how you're communicating with them, but how you're getting input with them. And for example, maybe there's a way, uh, maybe there's a student leader that you can put, that can come meet with you. I know they might say, gee, we want more ice cream in the school, or we, <laughs> we want this or that, or longer recess. But maybe there's a way for a, a, a learning and growing opportunity with maybe an older student who could be 
occasionally part of your group and parent input. So I don't know if you've explored some of that stuff, but just curious. But outstanding job. That's my main message. But I'm wondering in terms of how to get input, not just sharing the information, but input from the students and maybe having like a leader student as an opportunity for her or him to, to have a growth opportunity and then the parents. And that, so that's the question part. <clears throat> so we haven't actually totally explored that yet in terms of having inviting students to join us in any of our meetings but we do have a student council where students from the upper grades do get together and come and talk about different things for our um, our school so we actually just did a little brainstorming off to the side over here um, and we were talking about what a great idea it would be to invite some of them just to come and sit in our meetings, have conversations with us, let us know, you know, from a student's view, how we can continue to improve our school, you know, beyond free ice cream yeah. and things like Great. that. Thank <laughs> you. <coughs> Anyone else? So I have a couple comments. So I, I, I'm glad that Ms. Takor, I got that right, right? You got it. Highlighted that it's staff donating their time, and I think that's just yeah. tremendous. 19 that's people huge. showing up on a Monday morning, and, and I'm a teacher, so I know what Monday mornings are like. <laughs> so that's just huge, but I think that lends itself to the testament of your leadership and the buy-in and the relationships you have with these teachers, that they're all coming in. It's obviously a productive meeting for 19 people to show up, and it's just a tremendous effort, and I appreciate that from all the teachers and from you. And I'm a proud alumni of, of Emerson Williams, so. <laughs> Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well done. Thank you. All right, can I have a motion to approve the February 11th, 2020 regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting? So moved. Second. Any discussions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll abstain, I was not here. Thank you. you motion missed me. passes. All right, now is public comment. Anyone wishing to make comment, please come to the podium, state your name and address. Beth Riley, 12 Hubbard Place. Uh, good evening. I want to start out by thanking all of you guys. I know this is a volunteer position. Um, thank you for your continued service. Um, starting out nice and ending not so nice today. Um, so I'm here today to ask for two things, more public transparency in regards to the budget, as well as an itemized list of possible cuts, which I'll get into later. Um, and trying to be more involved in our town, multiple people suggested I attend the Board of Ed meetings. I attended all three budget meetings. While these meetings were informative, I found them to be more for clarification purposes and discussion. Um, I understand this board is trying to do things a, a little differently with holding these budget meetings ahead of the typical timeline. And while I applaud your efforts, frankly, I thought these meetings were a waste of time. I was waiting for the specifics. What were the proposed cuts gonna be? How can I advocate for what I think are appropriate cuts and where there should not be cutting? This did not come up in any of the budget meetings. I was dismayed to recently read on Facebook and hear through the grapevine of proposed cuts. Where did these proposed cuts come up? What are they exactly? Is the public gonna be informed about these cuts? Without knowing what the proposed cuts are, I wanna stress that we need to continue to base our decisions around data. There are experts in the field doing good research out there. We need to continue to use data-based decision-making in thinking about this and future school budgets. 
In my time in Wethersfield, I found it extremely hard to be an informed citizen here. Whether it's Republicans or Democrats in the majority, I don't really care. I just want to be informed about the goings on in our town in order to advocate for what I feel is best. I attended all the budget workshops in order to do this. I have expertise in this area. Why don't I know what's going on? Why does it now seem as though there are meetings held behind closed doors? I'm here asking for public transparency whenever possible throughout this budget in future budget meetings. Chuck Carey, Board of Ed Chair, you've said that you're a numbers guy, which I appreciate because I'm a numbers girl. I'm asking that you work with Mr. Emmett and Matt to make a public document with the proposed cuts, what percentage of the budget is being cut, as well as the dollar allocation uh, this represents. For example, a 0.1% decrease would represent roughly $100,000 and would mean a cut to maybe whatever, freshman tennis, as well as two pair professionals. A 0.2 cut would mean the above cuts plus an additional curriculum specialist, et cetera. I'm asking that this document be made public and that it be posted to the Weathersfield Public School website. I'm asking that this document of potential cuts be from a 3.56% budget all the way down to a 2.5% budget. As my biggest fear in all of this is that you'll go to town council with a number that reflects some extremely hard decisions and they will continue to slash this number further. I'm respectfully asking that this document be put on the website no later than Tuesday, March 3rd, which gives you one week. I'm making a public request that this is done so that any citizen in Wethersfield can be informed and look up the potential implications to the quality of education in Wethersfield. This needs to be a fully transparent process. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make comment? Please come up, state your name and address. Hello, I'm Marjorie Carson. I'm at 12 Avalon Place. I have a sixth grade um, son and a, and a daughter in ninth grade. So I have a kind of big perspective here on school, you know, parts of the school system. So I would like to communi communicate to the board my great concern with budget cuts that are currently being considered by this board and also being pushed by the town council. The heart and success of this town lies significantly with the quality of its schools. If you continue to make huge cuts to the district budget year after year, then the quality of our school system is simply going to go downhill. There's no way around this. And I want to emphasize that our wonderful town of Wethersfield is not the only town in the position of rising costs, educational costs. West Hartford, Glastonbury, Newington, Granby all face the same issues each year, and their mill rates are as high, higher, or right behind us. We're all really in the same situation. The issue for you and us is what are we going to do about it? Is our answer going to be cut to cut and cut again to a point where teachers are cut, music programs are cut, sports are cut, all due to the main goal of keeping the mill rate down? Should the children coming up in our school system suffer because this, always get less because of this, year after year? I mean, what is the answer here? Um, and they already are. First, the town council cut the school district's budget by 700, over $780,000 last year, and it would have been much greater cut if the state hadn't given us last minute funding of over $200,000. And the current mayor of, our town, mayor of our town, Mr. Rell, stated in a recent edition of Weathersfield Life, and I'm paraphrasing, that last year's cuts had no real effect on the children. Well, this is absolutely not correct. And perhaps you all should suggest to him and the rest of the council that they need to listen more carefully and stop putting their heads in the sand because they don't want to acknowledge that their decisions absolutely affected our schools. Needed positions didn't get filled. It's, it's a fact, it's a fact. And even currently there's a position at the high school, a special ed teacher is still is needed desperately at the high school and it isn't even in the budget for next year where there's more actual special ed kids coming into the high school from eighth grade right now. If you talk to you know, the um, principal of the high school, you know this. Um, and maybe the town council needs to hear this. Um, and in August when my daughter was sent her freshman, uh, her schedule for freshman year, the spot where she was told she would have a required social studies class was missing, was missing and a study hall was in its place. 
Why? Because that summer, due to budget cuts at the high school and state mandates on civics classes for juniors and seniors, the principal had to take out half of freshman social studies. This is also the same freshman class, the first class that needs an additional five credits to graduate according to new stand state mandates. So the entire freshman class was affected, almost 300 people by this budget cut, by that the town council instituted. So meanwhile, our, all our neighboring towns continue to offer a full year of freshman social studies, as did all of you, I'm sure, when you were a freshman many years ago. So please, as town leaders, be honest about how your cuts are affecting our students and our children. And as we all know, when the quality of an investment in our schools go down, the values of homes gradually go down too. And this leads to even higher mill rates. So what is the point here? Would you rather have a slightly higher mill rate with quality schools and valued property or less quality schools that lead to lower property values that lead to even higher mill rates? So which is it? Because we are, based on last year's cuts, we were at a point of really soon, a point of no return because we were cut to the bone last year. So next, if you just give me a little more time, <laughs> I'd like to address the heavy influence of the mill rate, which I get so frustrated with. The mill rate, this number is like the scarlet letter M that towns and cities must wear to show their tax rate, right? But I wanna emphasize to the board and people here that, the, uh, um, that it's largely an arbitrary number in many respects. Why? Because the mill rate is applied to each town differently. Each town has different property values. The mill rate of Glastonbury may slightly be lower at 36.36, but their property values are generally higher than Wethersfield. So their citizens are often pay or pay higher than us in Wethersfield, um, even if it's based on same, similar or same style house. So, so my house in Wethersfield could easily be worth $20,000 in Glastonbury, based on where in Glastonbury, and that homeowner in Glastonbury could be easily be paying similar or even higher taxes on that property with a lower mill rate. Similar to Hartford. Hartford has a 74, point, uh, 74 mill rate, but the property values are so much lower that they actually pay less taxes on those properties. And so their mill rate has to constantly be increased. So my point with this is that mill rates are not and should not be the whole story, but all too often they're used as a sole measurement of success or failure for town councils and superintendents. Um, and this can lead to arbitrary decision making. And I don't want your decision making to be arbitrary, just based on numbers. Oh, we can cut a secretary. We can, there's gotta be somebody we can cut that's not a teacher. Oh, we don't need this many teachers. Oh, we don't need this program. We don't need world languages. Well, you know, other schools have world languages. Other sc uh, school systems have these things. You know, they're gonna compare our town to theirs and they're gonna be a more successful town because of it. So. Instead of the mill rate, I think the larger part of the story is that the value of one's home is a major part of what taxes we pay, and towns with higher quality schools absolutely have higher value property rates. And as a result, the children from those schools get a very good education. Their high schools are looked on as stellar institutions when it comes to college applications, and when parents eventually decide to sell their home, the value of that property allows them a good return on their investment with not just consistent equity they have paid into, but a profit they can use toward retirement. This is the American dream, right? The, the middle class payoff where you keep and maintain good schools and your property values either maintain or get higher. And this you know, benefits not just me as a parent, but retired people in town as well, senior citizens. It, it affects them too, it benefits them as well to have good schools. So my question to you and the town council's plan to Sacrifice, are you gonna sacrifice again and again the school district in order to tell voters <coughs> next election, well, at least we did not um, increase the mill rate. But then they forget to tell you, oh yeah, by the way, because we chose to cut the school budgets year after year, million dollars here, $500,000 here, your property values may not actually increase and they may actually decrease. And this will most likely you know, affect our property values. They probably will decrease because if this keeps happening before long, um, people will see there's clear lack of investment in the schools by town leaders like yourselves. Test scores uh, will look, go lower because of lack of investment. Infra infrastructure inf is falling apart because of a constant failure to invest in school buildings. Quality staff not applying or leaving because tired, they're tired of constant lack of funding. And also what bothers me is seeing this kind of 
as a, a ninth grade parent, a sixth grade parent, and seeing like last year there was like proposals, and basically it was going to happen. They were gonna get rid of a lot of middle school after school programs, music programs, um, the festival music program for the uh, elementary schools, and having my, seen my daughter go through all those and really benefit from those programs, and seeing that my son would not, and it's like, and I see Newington has these programs, Glastonbury has these programs, you know, Rocky Hill has these programs, and like we all of a sudden are gonna shut it down for all these students. Like, what, you know, where is this gonna lead? So it's just really frustrating. Um, so please, uh, I'm trying to close here. I strongly urge you to send to the town council a proposed budget that fully funds the needs of the school system. And I mean fully funds. You know, put that needed special ed teacher in the budget. It's not even in the proposed budget right now. Um, like, you know, that's an important position. Um, I struggle, um, you, are, you are the experts on this, so it's your role to tell the public and the town council what the needs are to retain our quality educational system. And please, in your role as the Board of Ed, I would suggest that you do not do the bidding of the town council by making any cuts now. Let the council make those cuts after you have informed them and us of the needs. And your role is to advise them and us on what is best for our schools. If they choose to ignore your will and that of Weathersfield parents, then the council should ultimately be held accountable for that. I really get tired of the mantra of hearing town council members go, well, you know, we didn't make, you know, even though, you know, we didn't make the cuts, the Board of Ed made the cuts. The Board of Ed has to make those decisions. And they take no responsibility over the decision to cut the Board of Ed budget. Well, they should be responsible. They should own it. Especially since I know you guys are telling them, eventually, this is this, a $500,000 cut, cut would mean this. A million dollar cut would mean this. They know. But the, the, the public doesn't know they know. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Suzanne Barton, 55 Main Street. I don't have notes, so I'm gonna hopefully do this in an organized fashion. Um, I wanna reiterate what Marjorie said and the importance of our mill rate going, our taxes continuing to climb if we have failing school systems needs to be reiterated to town council, and I'm sure she's going to do that as well. But it's also your job as the Board of Ed to protect our schools, and currently you're not doing that. Your proposed budget is a 3.6% what you're saying is an increase, but it's not an actual increase in any services to the school. And you're not protecting our schools. And it's your job as Board of Ed to go to town council and tell them why it is important to protect our schools and to improve services and improve our school system. Because right now, you are not doing that. And your current proposed budget does not do that. This is your initial budget. My three-year-old can tell you that you don't ask for what you think you're gonna get, you ask for what you want. He never comes in and asks for five, he always asks for five candy bars, he knows he's only gonna get one. My three-year-olds can tell you how to negotiate and you are not doing that and you are not protecting our schools and doing that and it's your job to do that. You are maintaining a status quo that is failing, we are failing in comparison to surrounding towns. Just this week, I've heard of two family mem two friends of mine who have young children who are moving out of Wethersfield with the, com the only reason they are moving is because of the school system. And as someone who has three young children who hope to be attending the school system through high school, it's very disheartening to hear. And you guys, the the partisan nature of this and the fact that you're going in with basically a zero gain budget is a complete farce and it's just ridiculous. And I really urge you to relook at the budget that you're proposing to improve our schools and not just maintain a status quo that is currently failing students and our community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary Kay Jensen, 23 Quail Hill. Um, I'm just here to echo basically everything these young uh, mothers are saying. Um, I am supposed to be a Jesus Christ superstar tonight, and I chose to come here because I've, my son, this is the truth, okay? This is why my hair is done. 
And um, because it's never done. And I am here because I've I've been coming since my son was three. We moved here when he was 18 months. My mother-in-law said, you need to come here. Weathersfield's in great school systems. We're happy at Highcrest, so it's fine. But um, I've heard that the kids are not getting into the colleges that they used to be getting into. I am really disheartened to hear about the social studies program. In this climate, in 2020, with what's going on, kids need history more than ever. That's, it's disgusting. Um, when I look back at all the meetings that I've spoken up to in the past, please support the Board of Ed budget. I'm realizing I'm always just asking to keep it the same. And there's no new programs. Look, I, I don't have my phone on me, but I just read somewhere, maybe in Mr. Emmett's proposal or something, that there's no uh, new programs coming. There's no, nothing slated. And I'm just wondering why somebody would choose Weathersfield. There's two houses on my street that's for sale, <coughs> one on my street, one on the street over, and they're not selling. And I'm thinking, who's moving here if you're going to raise children when you can just go across the river or to West Hartford and just get phenomenal programs? Um, I don't, I just, I'm, I'm upset. I'm, I feel like I'm normally here and I'm a good cheerleader, but I'm just, every year I show up and I realize I'm just asking you to not make more cuts. And I, I'm, kind of, I'm sick of it. And I think everyone else probably said it better than me, but um, I will continue to show up. I want more. Next year, I want to see progress. I don't want to keep coming here and say, keep it, keep it as it is. You know, we don't want more cuts. I'm, all, I'm done with that. And I'd like to see our schools improve dramatically. I want people moving to our town. I'd like to see our ranking go up. I don't like going like this and turning the page and seeing Weathersfield High School. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make comment? Seeing none, we will move on to communications. Mr. Emmett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. I do want to speak of the budget uh, first and foremost. Uh, at the most recent uh, budget workshop held over at the Stillman Building, the general consensus among the board was for us to come in at 3%. On Friday afternoon, I presented to the Board of Education in your Friday packet a uh, draft of reductions that get us down to a 3.11%. Our draft budget was $57,797,537. The reductions to get to 3.11 are $100,000 in IT department, not Chromebooks. The IT department was very clear that the Chromebooks needed to be in place to replace those that are coming off lease and make sure that our kids get the units in their hands. The uh, WHS nurse tutor, there is a savings of $25,000. That particular savings will be recognized because we have a student that's aging out that is pending a PPT. I expect that that position will likely be absorbed to cover a vacancy elsewhere in the district. We have an outplaced student graduating that was in next year's budget. That was a total of $85,000. Um, that is confirmed through a PPT, so that savings can absolutely be recognized. We are also projecting additional choice revenue as I work to maintain a total enrollment in Weathersfield of 3% for open choice students. I'm working on that right now with an expectation of declaring seats for the 2021 school year by March 1st. In addition to that, we're looking at a reduction of $70,000 for various programmatic supplies across all grade levels. That's the extent of where we are at 3.11. I need to make it clear that that does not take into account the process of health insurance. We projected at 10% when we set this budget proposal back in December, and right now the town is between 12 and 13%. We also have a cost involved with WFT salary upgrades. We're projecting at 60%. That's not in here either. 
So to the point of uh, constantly having to cut, I feel your pain. I felt it every year I've been here. And it is increasingly difficult to do more with less. You talk about uh, budget cuts. We talk about all the instructional supervisors we used to have. It is extraordinarily difficult. Yet we have a commitment to make sure that we're providing the best possible education for our kids. But I've said this, I've said it at budget workshops, and I know, Ms. Riley, you were there at the one budget workshop where I got up on the soapbox. It gets harder and harder and harder. So that special education teacher at the high school, I'm already trying to figure out a way we can use grant funding to be able to get that position back. But I'm running out of tricks in the bag. That's the reality. I get the mill rate, and I get the perspective of wanting to come in. Look, I could come in with a budget with a 15% budget increase. That's not realistic. I get that. But we definitely want to be able to provide our kids the high-quality programming that they deserve. That's the bottom line. We have our next budget workshop coming up on March 3rd at 6 p.m. We were able to achieve quorum for that, so March 3rd at 6 p.m., the lower level of the Stillman Building. What, what will be on that? What will be there? Because what I'm hearing these parents ask for is specifics. They want to come and hear specifics, or they want to hear us on a spreadsheet what 2.0 looks like as a cut. They want to hear what 2.5 looks like. So I you heard, can't motivate them unless they see I something. I heard two things. I heard what a 2.5 looks like, and I heard add more. Oh, I, I did heard, too. I, I heard yeah, two absolutely. things. Yeah. So where we are right now is this. We, by charter, must send forward a budget by March 15th. You want me to present the budget at the regular board meeting on March 10th, that is what I am prepared to do, and then the board needs to take action on that budget at that time. So my expectation is for the next budget workshop on the 3rd is you all are coming together and coming up with where you need me to be. I came in at 3.66, that's where I'm at right now. You need to tell me where you need me to be. Can no. I comment on? No, we should be at this point in time. If I could please do my communications yeah. oh, to finish sorry, up. Michael, yeah, I apologize. Thank you. Because we shouldn't, we shouldn't be no, engaging no, in no, that. Because I have a lot of other items yeah, that I need to get through. Like Want to follow up uh, with the web water? Uh, we did some water testing with the Central Connecticut Health District, and uh, we found that there was discoloration in the water. So the CCHD came out and did testing. They found an elevated level of copper in that water. So at this point in time, we've closed down the uh, classroom uh, water fountain units, and the town is in the process of installing new units in the hallway that will feature filtered water and will have bottle fillers. Uh, I sent a communication out to the web community on Friday, followed up with another communication today. At this point in time, the um, vendor has the units ordered. Uh, they expect them to come in tomorrow. Uh, they've already been out to scope out where these are going to go. In the meantime, we have uh, water coolers in the hallways. I did go to Webb today and stood around the water cooler with first graders enjoying a cup of cold water. They love it. They actually, they cannot figure out with the bubbles and how that all works, but um, we're working on that. In addition to that, knowing that our buildings are as old as they are, I've asked the town to take a look at our other buildings as well. Amerson water has already been tested and found to be fine but I want the CCHD to come out and test Hanmer, Highcrest, uh, as well as Charles Wright, just to be sure. Highcrest Portables are out to bid. Um, they've actually extended the bidding for a week because they've had a lot of interest. Um, at this point in time, no one has come forward and said that they cannot meet the timeline, so the expectation would be that we get um, a, a number of bids as opposed to just one as we've typically gotten in the past. Tomorrow evening, we have student programs and services. Just want to reiterate that meeting is open to all board members. That is a meeting where uh, we'll have some interactive work with Weathersfield High School teacher leaders on the portrait of a graduate. The meeting will seek board member input and feedback, so all board members are encouraged to <coughs> attend. It's tomorrow at 6 o'clock at Stillman. Uh, tonight, in terms of action items, we have uh, on the item, uh, including the cancellation of the April 14th Board of Ed meeting, this will be the last time that we're coming forward with one of these types of action items. As you know, we set the Board of Ed calendar, uh, meeting calendar for next year. It does not contain um, vacations. So we're taking, this will be the last one. 
And again, April 14th falls on vacation. Uh, and again, don't, don't forget after vacation, April 20th, uh, 2020, right here, 7 p.m., we have the uh, town workshop, or not the workshop, rather, the uh, budget hearing, 7 p.m. here at Council Chambers. Had the opportunity uh, to attend last Thursday the uh, annual CREC Legislative Breakfast. I know Mrs. Granado also attended. Um, we did not have any of our elected leaders attend this particular session, um, but it was meaningful in that we were able to see what House bills are coming forward for the short legislative session. I included those in your Friday packet. Uh, coming out this week, I have an analysis that comes from uh, CAPS on each of these and the potential implications of those bills. Um, sad news here, our long-term English sub at WHS has departed uh, the district to take a long-term sub position in another district. We have done interviews and we have a candidate prepared to begin on March 16th. So uh, hopefully be able to fix that one quickly. Also want to uh, mark a couple of dates for you. Do not forget our 2020 Family Steam Nights are next week at the Pitt Community Center. And they are on Monday, March 2nd from 6 to 7.30, that's High Crest and Hammer. And Tuesday, March 3rd, 6 to 7.30, Emerson Williams, Charles Wright and Webb. And finally, last but not least, for those of you that need a little bit of relaxation, the Leap Into Spring Paint Night over at Weathersfield High School is happening this Thursday from 6 to 8 in the Weathersfield High School Art Rooms. Tickets are $7. You get a canvas and you have members of our um, student population, our artists, <coughs> who will assist you in your painting. So if you have the opportunity to do that, please um, RSVP to Andrea Haas. We typically get anywhere from 80 to 90 people yeah, that come out. Yeah. It's a very popular yeah, event. So very good uh, event. if you're able to, um, please get there on the 27th. Come out to work, All right. <laughs> and with that, that's communications. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to action items. Can I have a motion to move the, the Weathersfield Board of Education cancel the regularly meeting scheduled for April 14th, 2020? So moved. so moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussions? Questions? Mr. Emmett ans already answered that in his update. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve the healthy food certification statement for the 2021 regarding healthy food options? I have a second. Second. Mr. Emmett, any discussion? Yeah, this is an annual um, uh, item that we take care of. We submit this to the state of Connecticut. The state of Connecticut requires the board to take action on this. We must um, send the minutes of this meeting along with the approval to the state. Um, and as I said, this is due by July 1st. We like to take care of it so that it's out of the way prior to the end of the fiscal year. Excellent. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve the healthy food certification statement for 2020, 2021 regarding food and beverage exemptions? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes. <coughs> Moving on to announcements and information. Board members, check your packet. Make sure we're attending meetings, letting chairpersons know if you cannot attend. Meetings held, Memorial Day Parade, Mr. Cassio. Yes, the Memorial Day Par Parade Committee met. Uh, it is going to be Saturday, May 23rd. Uh, everything is under underway. Uh, theme will be announced. Uh, parade marshals will be uh, also announced as well. Um, the uh, eighth grade middle school essay contest is underway. The elementary Art school programs doing their posters are on the way and we're looking for a high school uh, individual to get involved with the committee. So we're working on it. It's going well. Thank you, Mr. Cassio. Correct council meeting on 2 19 20. Okay. Brown. We had the correct council meeting on Thursday the 20th at the state legislative office building because we had um, Hassa Cave and Crack Legislative Breakfast that morning. Um, Hassa is the superintendent, the Hartford Division. Cave is for Board of Eds, and Crack is the um, Central Connecticut Education Council. Um, Michael and I both attended, and we heard and read about state legislative work for investing in our students, supporting our schools, and attracting quality educators from diverse backgrounds. There was also discussion about work to lessen the special education financial burden on school systems with a more regionalized approach. 
Uh, CREC meeting followed immediately with a very short agenda. We voted to participate in the RESC, which is the Regional Education Services Centers, their Alliance grant application to expand an existing online student transportation database, an interactive map that will be used for special education routes to out-of-district facilities. But I want to um, give a compliment to Michael Emmett because you were very skilled in networking that day among all the superintendents, the Board of Ed, and the correct people who were there. Thank so you. So it was a great breakfast. Thanks. Thank you. Finance and operations tonight, Mr. Michaels. Yes, we just met before this meeting uh, for an update <clears throat> on the fiscal year to date. Uh, we are currently roughly 57,000 over budget, um, but that has come down just under 15, so we continue to work at that uh, month over month. Um, and then we also discussed, as you heard, that our next workshop has been added for March 3rd at 6 p.m. in the Stillman Building. Um, and that was it. Thank you, Mr. Michaels. Meeting and schedule, student programs and services, 2 20 at 6 p.m. That's tomorrow night. All board members are welcomed. The portrait of the graduate is going to be discussed and looking for feedback from us. Uh, WEC is on 3 9 20 at 4 30 p.m there is no unfinished business and public comment anyone wishing in the public to make comment please come to the podium state your name and address seeing none we'll move on board comment oh, oh, Any, oh. Oh. Thank you guys. sorry no <laughs> take your time i wasn't trying to rush I just want to clarify, Mr. Emmett. So I am asking for what the proposed <coughs> cuts are because none of us in here know what they are before you said it. Mm -hmm. So that was the, what I'm saying. However, I want a full 3.66% budget pass. Gotcha. And in the future, we need to do better for our kids and our schools. We need better programs. I know on everyone's mind are new schools and possible referendums. I get that. I would rather have the crappiest leaky buildings and good programs any day over brand new buildings and crappy programs. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make public comment? Nobody's going to run out on me. No, nope. okay. Board comment. Mr. Cassio. Um, the notice that we got tonight regarding the budget meeting, do we have a quorum for that March 3rd meeting? Because we do. My understanding was we were going to be meeting either the 4th or 5th. Yeah, that's what came out, 4th or 5th. The 4th or 5th was the last notice yeah. we got. Yeah, nothing about the 3rd. I went back and looked to see. So I just went back to look, and it has been changing. So um, when we couldn't make the 3rd, other plans are being made. And then we announced what we're going to make the fourth or fifth. And it came out the fourth or fifth, right? So I, I just want some clarification. Do we have a quorum on that? You do have a quorum. We do have a quorum. I didn't even know it was existing. Did you know it was existing the third? All right. Well, who's going? Can we ask that question? On the third. On the third. I never got anything on the third. I went back to my my thing from. It's gone out of print. Because when we eliminated that day, a lot of us made other plans because right. our second notice was to go to the 4th or 5th. Right. Here it is. So if we're going to have a meeting on the 3rd, let's Me, make sure we Chris, have a quorum. Me, Chris, Ken, Lou, and Jim. And possibly Kelly. So we're not... Kelly, you got something that said the 3rd? No, no. It, it was Those were the people who responded. And then we threw out the other two dates to see if we could get more people, and we couldn't. So we went with the 3rd. So I'm not going to be there. Bobby's not going to be there. Kelly and Elaine. Maybe. Not me. She's a maybe. Kelly's a maybe. Bobby and Elaine can't make any of the So what are we, we, are we proposed to accept a budget on that day? No. It's the 10th. March 10th is the proposed. I know, but at that meeting, are we coming back with a percentage? What is your intent at that meeting? What is our intent? So it was the Wednesday the 26th. That's what I want to know. And, and. How much more are we going to meet? I think that's the question. We all know we gave a suggestion at our last meeting. So are we coming on the third now to we're going to accept a 3.1 percent? Yeah. I, can I just state, uh, and Michael Emmett said it in his comments, but that wasn't a consensus. 
that no, was that not was everybody. Not there was a group at those budget workshops that wanted 3.5. And we're, I know I'm standing with it, sitting with it. And, you, and everyone understood where I am. I'm mm -hmm. not looking. I, I'm in a full agreement with what the conversation that occurred tonight. I just think that is uh, the wrong way to go about doing a budget. Right, the 26th. Could I just make a thought? Um, so originally, I wanted to thank everyone who's come out for the budget workshops. I know they're exhilarating. Um, my understanding as a first year member of the board um, was that the workshops are meant for us to get the initial thoughts from the superintendent and have an opportunity to workshop those through with questions, comments, and concerns. My understanding is that the first list of any cuts, if you will, was what we were presented in our packet on a Friday that the superintendent just went through. There was conversations at workshops of if this, then what happens? Um, but there was no sort of, we're cutting this. I mean, I think the workshops have been an opportunity to ask questions, certainly as a first year person to say, I have a question about this amount of money and what does it go to? And as I said at the last workshop, I don't think as a director of theater operations that I should be sitting in a workshop saying, we're cutting X number of dollars in a particular program without an explanation or a what happens from the superintendent. So we left, uh, my understanding is we left that meeting with charging the superintendent of, okay, since we're all at different locations budget wise, if we said 3%, what does that look like in your mind? And the answer was the, the items that came back on Friday. Correct. But that's the first mention of cutting anything or reducing the budget with any concrete item. Correct? Yes? Can I ask a question just as a response to you um, and some of the things that came up? I think it... From my opinion, I feel like there was, we, we never kind of polled anybody because half of us say, oh, we should go at three, and half of us are like, why would we do that? Um, so I think we threw that out, like, oh, if we went with three, what would that look like? I don't know if that was a valuable exercise because we don't have a consensus of what the board wants to ask. Um, and I'll echo Beth in saying, I'm confused, and I have a binder that's this big, and I have emails coming every day for meetings. So. Um, I, um, I thought that the workshops were supposed to be for the community, for everybody to kind of get together, to kind of talk through what's going on. Because to be perfectly honest, the council's gonna most likely cut us even further. So sure, we have some things that are changing. We have a ever-changing um, you know, special education budget that we have to take into consideration. So. I, it's really confusing right now. So I think any sort of meeting, we should have a clear agenda and we should probably decide on when we're gonna talk about how, who, everybody up here, who wants to do what? Because I think just like any other negotiation, we need to figure out who's on what page and come to a agree to disagree and move forward. Isaac. Uh, so I have a couple comments not related to this. I, I agree with what Kelly just said, but I want to do, since this is board comments, a couple, couple other things. One, I attended the uh, web PTO meeting uh, last week, very well organized, and they had two main things that they were concerned of. One was the principal search, and they are pleased with where we're at right now, so thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, and secondly, they were very concerned about the budget and the comments that uh, mm -hmm. Some of the folks in the audience made tonight were similar to the comments that I heard at the uh, web PTO meeting. The other thing I want to mention is last night we had the career advisory board meeting. Thanks to Jim and Bobby for, for being there with me as well, as, as well as our 
uh, community members, business leaders, and parents. And a reminder, I bring this up every time because I'd love to see a lot of people there. April 24th is our second annual Newing, excuse, Newington, Wethersfield High School uh, Career Fair. And we hope to have about 50, 60 business folks there to showcase and to have our students go in and talk to those business professionals. Uh, it was great last year, it's gonna be even better. So if you can go as board members, either representing your business or just to see it, it's from seven to nine in the morning. And folks in the community, if you have a chance to stop by at our second annual Wethersfield Career Fair at the high school, it's April 24th. And that's it, thank you, Chuck. Yeah, just under my comments as well, not to start over with the budget and the date, but um, I had a great meeting with the Charles Wright parents on February 13th. Uh, at their school, uh, well attended, a lot of enthusiastic parents, a lot going on in the building, um, and you know it was great to get back in there uh, to see what's happening. Uh, they've got some uh, growing to do, some changes, some options, and the group really works hard for a small community. Great job. So. Thank you, group. Sure, can I say one more thing? I'm sorry, sure. real quick. I just wanted to thank the co people that came up and talked today. I think now is a really important time. I love hearing from anybody in the community. I mean, I get the luxury of going to pick up and going to basketball games and just talking. Um, but I do encourage anybody to come, but a lot of times I hear people say, I don't even like talking up here, but I don't wanna talk in front of you. So um, what I would encourage the public to do if you don't wanna come up and talk, cause it's a little <coughs> nerve wracking. Um, you know, I read every email, we read every email that you send. So. You know, for, for anybody that wants to get their voice out there and isn't comfortable, please send an email to us in the town council and really kind of voice your concerns as a citizen because we're here for you. So um, thanks for everyone that showed up. Thank you for your comments. Very thoughtful and educated. And um, I encourage everybody else to kind of share their viewpoint and please, you know, any way that you feel comfortable, let us know. Thank you. Any for, yes, Isaac. <coughs> oh, uh, can I go before you, yeah. Isaac? You put Isaac as a finale. Um, let's, last Friday, I observed a virtual reality social studies class at Hamner School. I'm telling you, it was an awesome experience for me, made possible by an invitation from Sarah Harris, who's the Instructional Supervisor of Technology, and I went to observe in Deb Vicente's sixth grade social studies class. They were studying ancient Egypt. I have to tell you, the lesson was brought to life by the utilization of this virtual reality technology and the collaboration by the students. As Patrick Cohn, the principal, and I observed these students, they are different, even from a few years ago. And I say different in, the, in a good sense, in that they are wired for technology. And they learn by collaborating with one another. Remember once upon a time that was considered cheating? Now they're always working with each other. This was a perfect example of the environment we've been discussing for some time where our kids learn as 21st century students. Um, I also want to mention that the Weathersfield Education Foundation, which is raising money for the school system, will be hosting a spring fundraising event on Thursday, May 14th. I'm delighted to announce that Dana Luby Neves, a Wethersfield High School graduate who's now Vice President and General Manager of WFSB Channel 3, will be our guest speaker. I think her chosen subject, local girl, local news, and why it matters, is the most timely one. You can find more information about this upcoming event on the Wethersfield Education <laughs> Foundation website, and I hope we can count on a strong community support for the very worthy Wethersfield Education Foundation. And I did um, write quite a few notes about our budget because of course it's the only thing I think about right now. Um, so finally, as it relates to our school budget, I'd like to make a point. And you've heard me at several school board and other meetings over the past several years state my belief that there's a direct correlation between the quality of our school system and the value of our real estate. I feel it's important to substantiate that claim and I wanna to point to two sources that I believe helps me with this case. The first is an article, February 16th, in the Hartford Current, and it was entitled, Where the Action Is, and it identifies Wethersfield as among the top 10 towns in the Hartford County 
with the strongest home sale gains in 2019. That's supportive data, but it wasn't conclusive. I think the following quote from a leading real estate agent in Wethersfield really seals the deal, and I did seek out real estate agents. And one quote was, buyers with children that are not tied into any certain town will take schools into consideration when purchasing a home. If our school system is not rated well, they will choose another town. If our school system is inferior to other towns, our property values will suffer as there will be fewer buyers looking in town, unquote. So as we go forward with our budget discussions, it is imperative that we consider this critical correlation between the quality of our schools, the town's commitment to the highest quality education, and the value of our real estate. So consequently, I think it goes without saying that good schools are not only vital to our children, but at least equally important as it relates to the value of our real estate, our homes. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac. Good evening, board members. Uh, for the Weathershed High School update in academics, we're halfway through quarter three. Uh, students have been assigned uh, to finalize their college decisions and are starting to start all that processing. In athletics, girls basketball lost in the CCC tournament, but however, they will be playing in states for the first round against Farmington. Senior Nicole Gwen beat the school record, becoming the all-time scoring leader. In boys basketball, senior night happened last night. Unfortunately, they lost to Newington in overtime. Boys ice hockey had their senior night, and a and are also playoff bound. Trevor Pasewick Sr. had his 100th career point on February 5th. Girls Ice Hockey attended the league's playoffs last night. The dance team competed at the Fairfield Ward Dance Jam, placed first in Palm, second in Jazz, and Weathersfield High School received an award for the most spirited team. The cheerleading team are the 2020 CCC North champions, and wrestling finished sixth at the CIAC Class L meet. For clubs and extracurricular activities, the drama students are getting ready for the spring production of the Adams Family, and club pictures ha uh, happened last week. Clubs such as Student Council, Journalism Club, <coughs> Young Democrats, and much others were present to have their club photos be taken to be in the yearbook. And lastly, as Mr. Emmett discussed, paint night will be occurring February 27th from 6 to 8 p.m., and it's $7 to attend. That is all. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? So I just need to set the record straight. There's a lot of misinformation out there about what was said at budget workshops. So in the proposed superintendent's budget, there was a line item for 2,000 Chromebooks to be leased. The discussion was around which ones were being replaced because of being outdated and what was the number we were gonna increase in our total fleet of Chromebooks, we were saying. <coughs> and there's 1,300 Chromebooks being replaced. And the question was, how much could we save if we didn't buy 700 more Chromebooks? There was never a discussion on cutting Chromebooks, it was just not increasing the number. Now in the new budget of 3.11% that was given to us on Friday, we'd actually be increasing our Chromebook stock by 700 which would go a long way since the board last year cut a thousand Chromebooks from being purchased. And back to my numbers from Ms. Riley. Yes, so twice in the last four years, the board has reduced the superintendent's proposed budget. In 16, 17, they reduced it by a percent. And in 18, 19, they produced it by 0.48%. So the, the discussions of the board trying to cut the proposed superintendent's budget is not abnormal. And the, the fact of the matter is the last five years, the board's average budget proposal sent to the council has been 3.13%, which is right around where some of us have asked to be at. In the last four years, the town council has appropriated 1.91% on an average. So as I said at the last board workshop, our board can't fix the misappropriations done by the last council in the last four years, but we can try to help improve it. So I think having a number around three tries to improve it but we can't fix everything in one year. So that will be it. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Opposed? Abstentions?